Zach Baer is equal parts businessman and musician, making him a rarity that understands both words in the term music business. The Zach Baer Band has new music and the Zach Baer Business has new technology. Let's explore both. Zach Baer, welcome to Noise11.com. I, uh, I've been thinking of a way to introduce you, Zach. Uh, I, I, think I've, I think I've nailed it. My old-mannered CEO from a great metropolitan company becomes nighttime rock star, able to leap tall lyrics in, in a single bound. <laughs> is, is that you? I'll take that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. <laughs> I will absolutely take that. <laughs> so, what came first, the uh, the businessman or the musician? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've always been a musician uh, in some fashion or other. Um, I started playing piano at a very young age. I was about four years old, uh, and my mother had a grand piano, and she would accuse me of you know banging on the piano, which I, of course I probably did at a four year old age. But I always loved music, and I got into music when I was um, ser- more seriously when I was in high school and college and whatnot. Um, but I, I also knew that at a very early age, I, you know, I didn't want to be that guy that would find some guys and go live in a one bedroom, you know, no air conditioning apartment in LA and try to make it. I knew my acumen was in technology and business and things like that. So I figured like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, build, you know, build my career in technology. And as I go along the way, I'm going to leverage that technology and the relationships and eventually which led to the music business uh, into my musical career. So it's kind of, it's a little convoluted, but it kind of came together, but it really didn't make a lot of sense until a couple of years ago when we released the first single uh, Rutherford drive, which was 2019. And, uh, that's when I was like, okay, look, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been playing clubs, you know, and whatnot forever, um, playing cover music. And I decided at that point, I'm really going to make a run at it and leverage the music business relationships that I've developed over the last 17 years. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, being a businessman, a businessman understands the business of music, whereas the average musician knows the term music business, but doesn't really understand that second word. So that must be quite right. an asset for you to have in both sides of your career. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely come in handy um, because I can see both sides of the equation. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, because I respect the artists that want to go do music and play music they like. But at the same point in time, when you're writing a song, I feel like that you know you can't make it so far out there and so left field and so right field that people don't understand what you're conveying to them in terms of emotion and in terms of what you're trying to say with your music. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm a huge Rush fan. I mean, but, but of course, like, you know, 75% of the population is probably not, you know, they're not Rush fans. Um, I, you know, I dream theater, you know, I love guys like that, but they're musicians fans. And the thing that I always came back to in songwriting was that, you know, it's the emotion first, you know, and you want to be able to touch people with what you're writing and then come back to something that makes them move and makes them feel good and and really tunes into that particular song that you're writing. Well, let's uh, go through both facets of your career and explain the, the business side of it before we get into the music side so we can knit the two together and it all makes sense uh, for the viewers here. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, in business, you go back to a company, I understand, called Media Tech, which would have been about uh, 15 years ago. Yes, yes. That's actually, um, that was my second startup company. Before that, I had another startup company called uh, uh, Voyant, which it was actually, um, uh, like, I, I, I'm a true nerd in every sense of the word. And I'd written some software that automated the configuration of network devices like routers and switches and things like that. Uh, when I was working for American Airlines and I ended up taking the software out of the company and raised a bunch of money and started Voyant. And then a year after that, um, I started a media tech kind of building upon um, my skill set of being able to use technology to do business process re-engineering and stuff like that. And in, in the process of that, we ended up taking the company public and had the opportunity to acquire some music 
oriented technology that married two of my favorite things, which are music and technology. And that technology was called NetBurn Secure. We did, developed NetBurn Secure. This is about 2002. So that you know, prior to iTunes, by the way, where you could actually download mix and match tracks from your you know favorite artist or whatever to a CD. It would burn the CD. You could not copy that CD because of our technology, and it wouldn't leave anything on the on the hard disk. So at that day and age, in the na- age of Napster and all the, the pirating and whatnot, it was very appealing to major label groups. So we ended up doing deals with a couple of different major labels, and our first major artist was uh, J.C. Chazay from NSYNC, which, you know, I mean, I'm a rock fan, you know, but, uh, you know, he did sell records, so it was all cool. Um, but shortly after that happened, it morphed into uh, more of the, the, the live disc, the, the disc live stuff. Um, Apple came out with iTunes, forever changed the idea of DRM and copy control technology. Um, and, you know, we were a tiny company and couldn't compete with, with Apple trying to figure out how we're going to, you know, convince them like our way is a better way. Um, so we pivoted and we acquired the original Disc Live in 2003. And in 2004, uh, in Disc Live, for anybody who's watching this, Disc Live is considered to be the pioneer in instant live recording where you go out and record major artists on a tour, generally every tour stop, so that the fans that go to that show get a, co- a copy of the exact concert they just saw. They can walk out with a CD or uh, a USB drive, and in some cases we've done even done DVDs in the past. Um, and that company became uh, really successful really fast. Um, we ended up doing a bunch of different artists, and by 2006, uh, we had a guy by the name of Mark Cuban come along and offered to buy a good portion of the company and ended up selling the company to Mark. And I retained the rights to the live disc technology, um, rebranded back to, to Rock House Live technology. And then briefly, I, well, four years, we uh, aligned with um, EMI and Capital Records, which brought me to Australia. Um, and I wish I can remember the neighborhood the office was in in Sydney, um, Surrey Hills. That's where it was. Um, and, um, uh, from there, I, yeah, I've really just been kind of doing it ever since, you know, we re- we rebranded back to disc live for the, um, you know, for the, the live stuff after universal made a bid to purchase EMI. And, and that was like 2012. Right. And then when did venue come along? Cause this is the public company. Is this now the one, over the top of everything you do? Yeah, it's kind of the mothership. Um, yeah, so Venue, I joined Venue in um, 2016 as the CEO. Um, I took over from a, a guy that had, he had never run a public, public company before. Massively good intentions, but I think he got in a little bit too much. And MediaTek was a public company. Um, so I came in and brought in um, my investors and my longtime uh, colleague, uh, Tony Cardenas, better known as Tony Montana from the band Great White, um, and really started about set, started about retooling everything that the company was doing. Brought in um, the disc live stuff through uh, an exclusive uh, arrangement that I did with the other company, and we ended up um, acquiring uh, Set FM, um, and it's Set FM which is basically just the digital version of what we're doing with Disc Live. It, it, it sends the concert to your mobile device and you can walk out it with it at, at the end of the show. And it's, it's really, really cool stuff. Um, the first shows that we ended up doing with, with Rob Thomas, uh, is where I actually re-met uh, Scott Dorsey um, this last summer. Um, but we've worked with Rob three years in a row. We've done King's X, we've done Patty Smythe, we've done... Um, probably about, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen artists since we acquired the technology. And Venue, you know, we've got two lines of business. We've got the consumer side, which is all the set FM stuff. We've got another side of the company that has the um, uh, uh, rights management side of it. And, I, and I'm, not sure, I'm pretty sure you guys probably have the same problem in Australia that we do here. But um, you have the performing rights organizations. And here we have DMI and ASCAP and CSAC. And they basically force 
independent businesses and radio stations to take blanket license agreements for all the music in within their catalog so they have the right to play that. Problem is, is that they generally tend to overbill for that, but the more, I call it an invasive problem, is that the artists who, whose music are actually, it's actually getting played, they're not getting paid for that. So Soundster is our other side of the house, which it's a cloud-based system that has physical devices that go in venues and uh, bars and restaurants and whatnot, listens to the music, tracks the music, tracks it back to the actual PRO that has the music so that at the end of the day, we can actually make sure that when the song's played, stakeholders of the song, like the songwriters and publishers, get paid. So it's a huge step in the way that the business done, has been done for the last 100 years or so. How does that work uh, technology-wise with live music? Because, uh, you know, as you know, uh, things like uh, Siri or Google or, you know, whatever the listening technology of the day is, can't detect a live song versus the recorded song invariably. So how does it, how does it pick a live song, a live performance, which is unique to that moment? Yeah, so the, the important thing about, um, about music is um, that there's fingerprinting technology that obviously we can u- utilize to recognize music that, um, that, well, has been fingerprinted, you know, recorded music that, you know, the radio and whatnot. Live music, on the other hand, we have, are developing algorithms based on a number of different um, scenarios, you know, whether the song is played slow or fast or the, the, the lyrics or um, the melody of the song. The variety of factors that go into identifying, uh, you know, what that song actually is, and we've actually tested the system with relatively, what I would say, horrible renditions of cover songs, and been able to identify them. So we're on the right track with that. Um, we're not there yet. We're focusing on radio uh, and recorded music first, but the live music is a, a key part of what we're doing, and we think we're going to get pretty close to, you know, 98 to 99% um, identification of, of that music. I would imagine the ultimate test for something like that would be to see if it can detect Bob Dylan songs at a Bob Dylan concert. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly spot on. You're totally right. But no, that, that's the holy grail right there. <laughs> Um, awesome. With all of these different revenue streams in the various companies that you're talking about, it all re- re- relies on live music. So how is the company going over 2020 and possibly into 2021? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, so obviously we were excited for what we thought was going to be an awesome 2020. Uh, we had Matchbox 20 booked um, for you know that major, major tour. We'd already started started pre-sales on that and the pandemic hit. Um, so what we didn't do um, in 2020, we think we're going to make that up in spades in uh, 2021 due to the fact that all the artists that have missed out on revenue this year are going to be looking ways to increase the revenue streams uh, next year. So we think next year is probably going to really, really make up for uh, 2020. Mm. I guess, you know, we have to sort of, like, I guess that term – the new norm that everyone seems to be using at the moment. We need to yeah. kind of kind of work out a way when the new norm is going to start to resemble the old norm for anything to be getting back together together in a uh, in a business sense. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of speculation on when the major events are going to start, and uh, the key consideration is there. You know, uh, are the insurance companies going to insure? these large events like that. And I think it's going to be a, a measured approach. I think that the smaller venues are probably going to experience um, uh, a faster comeback than the really major, you know, massive uh, events. But I think it's going to happen. I mean, uh, you know, I don't think that we're going to have a vaccine anytime ridiculously soon, but I do think that there's going to be one probably by the end of the year. You know, so by the time the spring touring season comes around, hopefully uh, uh, everybody but the anti-vaxxers will get the vaccine and we can go to concerts again. Let's talk music, the Zach Bear Band, and uh, you have the new EP out at the moment, uh, Ordinary Girl, and it sort of bookends with a song called Rutherford Drive, which was a 2019 song. Correct. 
Yeah. So um, Rutherford Drive, um, just a kind of a brief story about that. Um, I had, like I told you uh, earlier, I've been playing cover music for a long time and interspersing original music, and I've been writing original music for a long time, and uh, I finally decided to go ahead and, and um, record Rutherford Drive, and it actually w- went really well. We recorded at a famous studio in Memphis called Ardent Studios, and another studio called, <clears throat> excuse me, American Recording Studios, which was actually owned by Elvis Presley at one point in time, and um, put the track out in, uh, uh, in 2019, and it actually it just got a lot of traction. You know, it, we ended up, uh, we've probably had half a million streams on it so far uh, and over 200,000 plays on, on YouTube. So for relatively unknown, unknown band to do that, I was pretty encouraged by that. And then um, uh, ordinary girl, um, that song I'd written probably 12 to 15 years ago and put it into a demo form and never really, I I didn't do anything with it. I, I sat on it and, had intended to do something, but you know, life gets in the way and all this crazy stuff going on. And, um, I wrote it because there was a girl, um, she was contemplating uh, suicide. And after being surrounded with, you know, like love and support, you know, uh, she ultimately decided against it and continued to, to live her life. And that's what that song's about. And flash forward to, Last year, 2019, after after uh, Rutherford Drive came out, uh, we had uh, a young employee at one of the music venues that I own. Uh, and she was only 17, uh, excuse me, 28 years old, and um, she she committed suicide, and it really hit us very very hard. Uh, we were not expecting that, obviously, and there were no like obvious signs that she was suicidal. And it, it got me thinking again that I needed to, to finish rather for drive and actually do something with that song. Um, I still kind of, you know, waffled around a little bit, a bunch of stuff going on, you know, tours and whatnot and pandemic hit. And that to me was kind of my sign that I was like, okay, it's time to do this. The music industry is basically shut down. So um, <clears throat> had time on my hands. And um, I called up a buddy in Nashville uh, by the name of Skid Mills, who's a Grammy-winning producer. Uh, he's done Saving Abel. He's done a band called Twelve Stones and uh, Busy Top, Sister Hazel, a bunch of bands. And he's always in demand, so I knew you know, he, he's never available. And I was like, hey, I would really like to see if you would help me with a song. And he agreed to it. Um, so we cut the song. And first time I heard the instrumental, you know, after he added a secret toss to it, I was like, oh, my God, this is like amazing. You know, we got to make this happen. And at that point, I decided to go ahead and do the, the entire uh, EP. Um, and the song Ordinary Girl as a single came out on August 10th, but I was already working on getting a, a partner for suicide awareness because that's really that's what that song is about. You know, I mean, not every song ends with a happy ending like like that one does you know like my friend that worked for me at my venue did not end happily and um uh, so i pushed the release date of the ep to september 1st to coincide with national suicide awareness month and ended up partnering with an organization called um the american Fe- uh, foundation for suicide prevention uh, and donating 20 percent of the proceeds from any uh, sales streaming whatnot of both the single uh, and the EP. So it's, you know, the, the, the song and the EP itself, all the songs have like real meaning. And I'm really, really happy that I was able to uh, get together with um, a producer that could really help me um, articulate that musically in a way that, that, that people dig it. So you do have a band. Who are the other guys in the band? Uh, yeah, so um, my band consists of uh, my bass player who uh, joined first. His name is Daniel Dwight. He's one of the founding members of uh, Saving Able. Um, and my guitar player, his name is Dave, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> Jeff Cobble. 
And Jeff actually played with uh, an epic rock band called Medieval Steel. And then a, another gentleman by the name of um, uh, Jeff Ward who is my, my drummer. And he's played with a couple of Nashville, you know, kind of bands and, and a bunch of rock bands in Memphis. And those are my guys, four guys. Are they businessmen as well? Uh, one of them, yeah. Jeff, um, Jeff was a businessman until I un- sucked him into this band. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff Ward, yeah, my drummer. Uh, but everybody, you know, I mean, we're musicians at heart. Um, I'm very fortunate that I can do my job from anywhere um, and uh, have the ability to do that. But my goal right now is to get, get the band uh, into a charting situation so that by the time the touring, you know, starts next year, the guys don't have to worry about businesses or anything except playing music. Zach, <laughs> great story. Thank you for joining us uh, with us at uh, Noise 11. Oh, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate the opportunity.